Welcome back to the Agostino Zynga Show with I, your host, Agostino Zynga, and this is episode number 519. That's 519 Cinco Uno Nuevo of the Agostino Zynga Show. I am your host, Agostino Zynga. How are you doing? How are you feeling? Great, amazing, good to know. If it's your first time checking the show via YouTube, you know what to do. Smash like, hit subscribe, leave a comment down below. Greatly appreciated. You know what it is. Standard YouTube engagement sort of nonsense. If you're listening via the podcast app, more importantly, please leave me a five-star review or a four-star or a three-star or a two or even a one. I don't care. Any kind of response will be greatly appreciated just so people can see that people actually listen to this show. I know they listen to it. I look at the analytics, but I'm not that vain to start posting all my listening stats and stuff, even though they're really impressive. I'm not that vain to post those kind of things. So I'd rather you guys, my dear listeners, did reviewing for me. Then when people look at it, they'd be like, oh my God, that Agassino guy is so cool. Look, he's got all these reviews. Ah, ah, ah. Do you know what I mean? Let's give him free Balenciaga, whatever, right? That's what I want him to do. It's not going to happen probably that way. Maybe it'll be like free Vetema. I'll get the, you know, the sub brand, but I'm cool. I'm all right with that. It's from the school of Demna. But if you can leave me a review regardless, I'd be so, so, so appreciative. And then of course, last, last pitch from me, Subscribe to the Patreon. What are you waiting for? The Patreon's only one pound. It's the equivalent of one dollar per month. You get access to a bonus episode every single week. I just uploaded one on Monday. Another one will come at the end of this week, especially when I attend the raves and I've got my reviews on what's going out out, out there. And I might be giving you a bit of a recap on my night out and just some other bits and bobs. But if you want to get some of that stuff, then please subscribe to the Patreon. It's only one dollar. There's obviously other tiers too that you can join on there as well but for now you get one piece of bonus content per week plus all the stuff i do on my main channel plus all the stuff i do on my main podcast feed so make sure you sign up on there today at patreon.com forward slash agostino that's patreon.com forward slash a-g-o-s-t-i-n-h-o for more information it's in the description the link is right there click the url go in there sign up support the boy you know what i mean allow me to what what would I use those funds for normally? Obviously, the main goal is to obviously get a camera in it. I want to get a camera and then maybe later on, obviously, get a studio and shit. But immediate goal would probably go towards what? Maybe a, a cheeky can of Cronenberg. You actually can't get Cronenberg for a pound, can you, nowadays? I think Cronenberg's singles, the lowest I've seen them in an offy, it's like 120 sometimes but usually they go for like 150 or sometimes 179 is actually bumping it so you have to if you're clever you go to a tesco and you get the four pack and the four packs like 450 and then, you know what i mean you make the saving that way but imagine what kind of psycho goes to a tesco four pack to get four packs of beers to then go out on a night out do you know what i mean you have to be a real lonely i wonder who will do that eh? not me not me but anyway here we are back again another jam-packed show loads of things to get into don't delay don't stop right now get yourself a little drink i've got myself a little water here a little water a little hydration here i remember once talking not talking i remember once seeing somebody that i follow on twitter say something like oh um I'm proud of myself for drinking water or something. I don't know, some hot, some hot like club girl. And I was like, girls get away with murder, innit? Because usually, if you're a dude and you have options, and that was something that, we, you know, didn't really resonate with you, you just click on follow and be like, you know, this girl's a flipping, what kind of bum doesn't drink water? Do you know what I mean? But because guys are simps, myself included, you just keep following anyway. But I saw that, I was like, who doesn't drink water? What are you drinking then? I mean, I don't want to say what I'm thinking in my head, but you know what I'm thinking, right? And then what else is she drinking? Like, beer. Like, imagine a girl that doesn't drink water. Fair enough, guys that don't drink water. I don't, I don't know how, why you don't, but just imagine how, like, unsophisticated and just pure barbaric... Just just, just imagine the levels of barbarism that, ex, that kind of exist for a girl to not drink any water whatsoever. And it's like an achievement. She's like, oh, I pat myself in the back. I did yoga. I drank some water. What? So what are you drinking when you finish a workout or when you do a sh like, I don't know, you know, girls that, you know, they, I don't know, maybe not all girls go and work out, but I'd imagine if you got a little sweat on, I just don't know what they drink. I'm just trying to think in my head, is a girl going to go buy a bottle of Coke? I'd imagine some people like those flavored waters, right? Those little cherry things and whatnot, but no water whatsoever, zero. Like, is that your life that you're living right now? And if anything, it's a good indication of like, you know, the nastiness that people just have in their bodies and shit. It's just like, ugh. Like, imagine. But again, girls can get away with murder. A girl could say she doesn't wash. Hmm, maybe not washing. No, definitely washing. Let's be honest. There's a guy, there's, there's, there'll be a queue of dudes willing to, like, you know, smash a girl if she says she didn't wash for a week. 100% sure. Guys are gross that way. 
um, in that in that way, in that they have no standards really. Do you know what I mean, the standard is like, do you like me, and will you like me, and will you let me touch your boobs? That's a guy's standard. Can you can I touch your boobs? And if they say yes, you're like, okay, cool. <laughs> you will pop with just about anything. You know, what I mean, humiliation, um, lack of respect, like every anything, you would put up with it. You know, lack of hygiene, just so you can get your hands on those sweet, sweet A, B, C, D cups. You know what I mean absolute nutcases but yeah not me though not me i'm better than that not me not me i mean not me not me not me not me but anyway let's jump on into it loads of stuff to get into get my water and let's ride on in it ride on in first news of the day sad news to report on one person that i kind of listened to religiously religiously when i was in the gym you know i think of um uh what was it uh, was it Rich Slave and um, 100 Shots? I think those two albums, right? I absolutely rinsed them back to back in the gym whilst I was working out. Perfect gym music. If you're wondering who I'm speaking about, it's Yum Dolph, um, a Memphis-based rapper, unfortunately, was gunned down the other day and lost his life and succumbed to his injuries. Like, absolutely tragic news. Like I said, I'm a huge fan of his. Spotted his kind of, you know, ascent basically on the back unfortunately of the first shooting that happened which allegedly involved black youngster and um yo Gotti and the people who was beefing with in memphis and then from that the video for 100 shots was flopping incredible the song itself is an absolute banger so from then i just kept listening to the music but then unfortunately it seems like the beef didn't subside or i guess you know he maybe still had some enemies in this from the streets in memphis and you know t later on or maybe earlier this year well earlier this year um, the other day, unfortunately, he was gunned down outside of a bakery. And again, tragic, tragic, tragic story. Um, obviously not super unexpected because, again, he was the victim of that first um, shooting that happened in, was that 2017 or something, I think? 2017, 2016? But still, you would have thought, given the time that's elapsed and given that he's probably, he's, he's really, really kept his head down, really, for the most part, um, young Dolph. He's obviously popped up here and there recently with the whole Lamborghini giveaway that he did to tie in I think with Rich Slave album if I'm not mistaken he gave a Lamborghini to some young girl which was funny that whole story around it because you know she you know it probably cost her more money to have it running than to have it as a to have it running as a car than just to sell it but that was a good little thing that she that he did and then the only other recent thing that I've seen I've seen him in the news for was going back and forth with Soldier Boy right on the back of um Soldier Boy having beef with Key Glock or something and then they had a little bit of a you know online sort of back and forth but that's been about it he's kept his head down so it wasn't beyond the level of reasoning to think that maybe he kind of was you know was safe in his own city but it looks like he wasn't man so again r.i.p to young Dolph. thoughts and feelings go out to his family and everyone attached with him but this is a story um it says the 36 year old musician was shot dead in the bakery in his hometown in memphis on wednesday young Dolph, real name adolf robert thornton jr um released his debut album in 2016 and racked up millions of views other artists include megan stallion charles rapper paid tribute to him news of young Dolph's um death was confirmed by memphis mayor jim strickland and again the mayor is confirming it because this guy gave a lot to the community he did loads of charity drives um he's he's kind of well known for his um thanksgiving um thing that he does every day every year if i'm not mistaken the thanksgiving thing should have been today too if i'm not mistaken which is absolutely shocking um again giving money to charity supporting local businesses which was the one he was supporting actually was a local business that he had shouted out or he kind of got on their instagram to shout out their local bakery um just generally a pretty decent dude in that regard so it's no surprise that the local mayor would want to kind of come out and say something about his you know untimely passing he says a tragic shooting death of rap artist from young Dolph versus another reminder of the pain that violence can bring with it local media said the rest Sorry, local media said the artist was fatally shot while visiting Makeda's homemade butter cookie shop near the city's airport just before 1 p.m. local time on Wednesday. Just imagine what that local flipping um, business person feels like now. You get the rub of being associated or being like, you know, Young Dolph's favorite cookie shop. And now all of a sudden you're also now the location where he died, unfortunately. Do you know what I mean? Now are people going to hypothesize that you were part of it? Did you set him up? And it just kind of, it creates a bad, it leaves like a bad or like a dark cloud over the business. Do you know what I mean? And it's just, a, un, again, an unfortunate kind of consequence of just this unfortunate passing as well um his cousin told the daily memphian that the star had been visiting a sick aunt and was also set to hand out thanksgiving turkey something he did every year a representative of apa agency which this artist as a client said in a statement the company was shocked and deeply saddened at the artist's death the world has lost an icon of course yeah he was he was independent too that's why you haven't heard a label come out independent truly truly independent the world has lost an icon a great man a beloved artist who's been taken too soon so obviously independent so definitely go and check out his his albums 
obviously kind of you know remember him through his family who he kind of you know doted and loved over a lot always post them on social media stream his albums stream all his singles watch his stuff on youtube because again he was 100 independent so all those funds all those clicks all those views all those plays will help obviously support his family i'm sure with the businesses that he's got and the way he was kind of you know look the way he looked after himself and the way he kind of dealt with money how mature he was i'm sure he's put himself he's put his family in a position where they're not going to be hurting going forward but still man 36 years old is no way is no age to die especially when you're a popping rapper and you've just about you know he has he, he didn't even kind of come close to realizing his potential there was so much more to give really in that regard but you know r.i.p young Dolph, r.i.p young Dolph, r.i.p the Dolph. um long you know gone but never never forgotten your music will live on my friend your music will live on Next, we want to jump on a pretty interesting story and something that I kind of have a lot of experience with and something that, no, something that kind of touches home with me. So this is courtesy of Reuters. And it says here, a lawsuit over Subway um, now says, no, a, lo a lawsuit over Subway tuna now says chicken, pork and cattle DNA were detected, right? So there was this whole scandal happened, I think a couple of months ago, where it went all over social media that um, Subway were being sued because supposedly the tuna sandwich, they say tuna doesn't contain any traces of tuna in it and now they've been able to hypothesize that it's not even though it's not tuna it's got the contents of chicken pork and cattle all in including it to you know, give it that kind of fake tuna texture i guess just another kind of catalog in missteps and faux pas from subway a company who again i'm surprised they've been able to survive on the back of the whole jared thing on the back of this on the back of you know the viral videos that go the videos that go viral on TikTok, like literally, it feels like every other week there's a kid that works in Subway that's basically, you know, unraveling the secrets of Subway and how they make their chicken. And God forbid, <gasps> the chicken has actually come from an actual real chicken. It's actually from a tin or something, right? These videos go viral. People get flipping shocked at this stuff, but they still seem to survive. They still seem to kind of, for some reason, maintain the confidence of people. I don't know how and I don't know why. Because if you've ever had Subway for a prolonged period of time in your life, you know that it's not good. It really isn't good at all. It's like beyond not good. And I think the idea of Subway when it originally launched, right, this um, quick um, pick up and, you know, this, this quick in and out um, foot long sandwiches that you could get, pick your bread, get it toasted, put cheese on it, add stuff, blah, blah, blah. It was nice. Do you know what I mean? It was a nice idea in principle. It made sense. Okay, cool. That will be cool to have. But when you actually went there and you tried to actually eat that shit, like, oh my God. And again, this is a period in my life where I had, um, there was this scam going on, right? This little scam, this little finesse where people were selling preloaded accounts of like Subway. You know the Subway cards? Someone will sell like a preloaded Subway card account or they'd maybe add it with fun. I don't know what they were doing. We don't, I didn't ask, I didn't tell um, what I'm telling now, but it's, it's long, long gone. And um, you'd go to the store and you could basically get a Subway footlong for like a quid or like a fiver or something, right? For maybe like the price of one, you could get two. Or whatever deal had kind of um, sprung up on that day. No, I think it was that thing that this Subway did where each day there was like a meal deal. Or I don't know, there was a deal of the day. And basically you could get that for a very, very discounted price. And I remember for a period of time, I was eating that shit like, I'm, I'm not going to lie, maybe for like a, a month straight. I was eating Subway for like a month straight because I had that I had those flipping accounts. And then there came a time where one day I just started shitting all over myself, out of my nostrils, out of my mouth, out of my ears, every orifice in my body, every place I've got a hole, just, you know, stuff was leaking out of it. And I was sick for mad long, I think for like two weeks or something, right? I had the residue um, feeling of like some sort of food poisoning over you know gl you know gluttony whatever it is right over indulgence and from then on i've never eaten a subway ever again never ever ever eaten one and again i was a subway guy i used to go go there and eat the fucking nachos which essentially is just tortilla chips that they put in a cardboard box covered with cheddar cheese and put into a microwave or cover you know with some salsa microwave and just press something and then by the time you get the chips out it's just like cardboard and i'd eat those religiously um or not religiously that'd be my go-to side um the meatball sub i love the 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 italian one the one with the italian uh, bruv i i'd had so many subways of my life and then one day i just after again after two weeks of being bedridden you know, and and using up all the toilet paper in the house, I just thought, you know what, enough's enough, and I just cut it off to cold turkey. So I can't imagine nowadays. Again, this was a long time ago. This was like, I don't know, a, a while ago. Let's say, but let's say for now, there's so many different restaurants and stores and shops and even little kind of shops and whatever, little delis, whatnot that exist now. It, it's a real crime. Crime. 
it's a real shame if you would subject yourself to eating Subway because it's not even that cheap compared to like going to an actual deli or going to a restaurant and getting a takeaway sandwich or something that they make there. They, you know what I mean? It's not that cheap compared to it. It's like, what, a fiver or something, right? Six dollars or something for like a foot long. You could go to like a good, a, a decent restaurant and pick something up for a decent sort of price or God forbid, you can make your own at home for maybe the same amount, buying all the ingredients and, and having an absolute massive baguette instead of just one foot long. So people that are still eating Subway now, you legitimately are mentally ill. If you're still eating Subway, if that's your go-to lunch, because I remember back in the day when I used to be going to the office, because now obviously most people are working from home, but... Because again, ima yeah, imagine you're all, imagine you're Uber eating or delivering or door dashing a fucking Subway. Like, you are a sick motherfucker. You are sick in the head. You really are. And I, I pray for you if that is you, that person. But most people that saw you in Subway was just because you were just, you was, you was at work. And usually, whatever, wherever you work, mostly, well, mostly where I've worked in kind of centrally metropolitan areas, there's usually only a certain number of restaurants or places to go and eat, right? There's like a, there's like a coffee shop, maybe a couple of fast food joints, and then here, a pizza place, and maybe like a Subway. So, of course, after a period of time, you, you know, only, there's only so many sandwiches that you could eat right so maybe like a you know the classic ones that in the triangle shape so maybe one day you're like you know what i'm fed up i want to get a subway foot long and you go in there and once you eat it you, you regret eating it because number one it doesn't taste like anything because i remember once seeing them putting the baguette in the in the actual oven and it was like the size of my pinky it was incredibly incredibly small and it comes up it's all fluffed up it's not it doesn't really have anything to it it's no substance to it um you <clears throat> They say it's toasted, but by the time you cover it in sauces and shit, it's back to being soggy again. Useless placement, useless place. But let's let's go anyway. Lawsuit over Subway um, tuna now says chicken and pork cattle and DNA were detected. Says the following in this article, courtesy of Reuters. <clears throat> It says uh, the following, um, a new version of the lawsuit accusing Subway of deceiving the public about its tuna products said lab testing now shows it contains animal proteins such as chicken, pork, cattle, and not the advertised 100% tuna. That's what they advertised it as, 100% tuna. Come on, man. I guess you could get around this if you're cheeky because 100% tuna could mean 100% tuna from 100% tuna extract, so that kind of stuff, right? But it's like, it's like when they say 100% juice. 100% fresh orange juice, you know what I mean? Um, and then you look closely and it's like, you know, from flipping, whatever they call it. There's a word they use to, where it's not actually from the orange. And he continues, it says, um, Karen Danawawa, Danawawa and Nailima Amin filed a third version of the proposed class action lawsuit a week in the federal court of San Francisco near their homes. Subway said in a statement they will seek to dismiss the reckless and improper, and improper lawsuit. The chain said its plaintiff filed three meritless complaints, changing their story each time. High quality, wild court, 100% tuna was regulated strictly in the United States and where around the world. Since the case began in January, Subway has run TV ads and launched a website defending its tuna. It's also refamped its venue, but it's not its tuna, saying an upgrade wasn't needed. <clears throat> okay. They're sticking by it, isn't it? Doubling down on their tuna. <clears throat> Sorry about that. <clears throat> Got a frog stuck in my throat or hay fever. One or the other. Um, it continues here. It says, original complaint claimed that Subway um, sandwiches um, and wraps were bereft of tuna, while an, an amended complaint said that they were not 100% sustainably caught sip, skipjack and yellowfin tuna. U.S. District Judge John Tiger dismissed the second version last month saying the plaintiffs did not show um they bought subway tuna based on alleged misinterpretations he did not rule on the merits and gave the plaintiffs another chance to make the case the november laws eight notes relies on testing by a marine biologist on 20 tuna samples taken for 22 restaurants in southern california They've got a marine biologist imagine that you go to flipping marine biology university wherever that means um, or whatever that sounds like, or whatever that course is. And then here you are being um, used or being kind of um, brought into a case where you have to sample 20 tuna samples from various different restaurants of Subway in California. All what a life. It said 19, 19 samples had no detectable tuna DNA sequences, while all 20 contained detectable chicken DNA, 11 contained um, pork DNA, and 7 contained cattle. Many people cannot eat various meats because of their diet or religious issues. Is there a religion that exists where you can eat tuna, but you, could be, you, you can eat tuna, but you can't eat pork? What religion is that? I guess that's what, is that, is that, um, is that uh, if you're Muslim, you can eat tuna, but you can't eat pork? Why do I think tuna is pork though? I don't know why I think that. I don't know why I think there's there's pigs swimming in the ocean. 
But yeah, that was a proper 62 IQ moment there. Big up Wings of Redemption. Let's continue. Many people cannot eat various meats. Um, da, da, da. The complaint said that the testing showed that the Subway mislabeled its tuna products and duped its consumers into paying premium prices. Amy said the ordered... Um, she ordered um, Subway tuna uh, products more than 100 times from 2013 to 2019. Imagine having to look at your bank statement and count up the amount of times you've been to Subway. Like, that is up there with, like, one of the worst things I'd ever want to spend my time doing. Surely a lawsuit isn't worth it, that amount of time, to count there, counting all the flipping times that you've contactless paid for a fucking tuna baguette. Yowzers. The lawsuit seeks unspecified damages for fraud and violations of the Californian consumer protection laws. The case is da, da, da. so in this case, right? You think to you think to yourself, in terms of reputational damage, Subway can't afford to settle outside the court, can they? They kind of have to go all the way and get the get the case dismissed. Because if they settle outside the court, people are gonna immediately think they're guilty and they're immediately gonna think their tuna isn't tuna. And if they stand by their hundred percent tuna claim, they're gonna have to prove or they're gonna have to prove via the court some way by getting it thrown out that this case or this lawsuit is meritless and you know is a complete waste of time because if they settle it's a wrap but then again i say then it's not do you know what i mean look what happened to gerard do you know what i mean that like, he's fine no he's well you know he's not fine but he got caught doing what he got caught doing and somebody didn't miss a beat like obviously you don't you're not going to blame them for his flipping crimes but still they suffered no reputational damage from that whatsoever like people still eat there willingly. They take their kids there sometimes. Even take flipping happy. They're flipping birthday parties for their little kids in flipping subways, knowing where everything happened with them. So I don't know, man. Um, good luck to Subway. Good luck to the guys and girls or the girls I think who are suing them. If they do, they'll get an amazing come up, especially during the pandemic. You can't hate on that, innit? You can't hate on that. Continuing on with the food news and tickling my um, long obsession with this. Again, places that I stopped eating at a long time ago. I think what, what happens, right? When you're, when you like, hmm, what happens, what happens, what happens, what happens? Because I'm an odd bunch. I'm an odd one. I'm a weird one. I don't really like egg and pasta on egg. I don't really like rice and pasta too much, right? I don't really give a shit. I'm not, you know, there's people who really love, love pasta, ca pasta covered with cheese, olive oil, just salt. They, they, they're all over it. Rice, the same thing. White rice, doesn't matter. Do you know what I mean? They're all over it. But I don't really have an issue with that sort of stuff. That's not my kind of Achilles heel. Even carbs, bread and shit, I can give that up in a heartbeat. Not, not that big of a deal. The issue I have and what makes me get fat mostly is processed food, like shitty stuff, like Subways, fast food stuff like McDonald's, um, whatever else it, that may be there. And another thing that was really one of my big Achilles heels was Greg's. I had a thing for Greg's back in the day that was just insane. Like that sausage and bean melt, like, oh was just, I love that thing. I used to get that all the time and I'd be upset sometimes I'd go to a Subway. I mean, sorry, to a Greg's. See, I'm, I've got Subway in my brain. I'd go to a Greg's and they wouldn't have it, um, it wouldn't be, it wouldn't be, um, it'd be kind of cold, basically room temperature wise. And I get sometimes upset. Then I realise that, oh, you could take those home you fat fuck and you could oven them yourself and this is what i started doing i started buying them like buying them a lot and then deciding to put them into the oven to kind of heat them up and then and then i discovered in greg's those flipping pizza slices they make those pepperoni slices absolutely sublime and i absolutely rinse them like i used to spend a good 10 20 pounds or 20 pounds let's say a good 10 pounds in, in flipping greg's and if you've ever been to a greg's or you know don't know what a greg's is it's basically a breakfast establishment or basically an all-day sort of you know uh, snack establishment where you can get you know like uh, sausage rolls you can get toasties you can get like I said um, the little pepperoni pizza slices type things you can get crisps sandwiches all that sort of stuff right and it's very difficult to spend 20 pounds in those places like that because for the most part you're buying a meal right and then you're also buying maybe a little side thing so what are you also buying that's going to make up 20 pounds it's very difficult to do so and I used to do it easily so you got you you see what my um what the flip, flip, flipping fat boy inside of me was screaming. But this is interesting news regarding this again to tie in with everything that's going on with the pandemic at the moment. <coughs> so yeah, this hay fever is kicking my ass. So the following: Greg's vegan sausage roll hit by supply chain distribution, distribution disruption. I guess you know. Learn to read. It continues here. It says, Greg's admitted that its vegan sausage rolls are being hit by supply chain disruption. The bakery chain has already acknowledged that um, it was not immune to the company-wide problems getting goods to shelves. 
Uh, so economy wide problems getting new um, goods to shelves, but boss Roger White shared or was a white side declared last month that the sausage roll is safe but now in response to imagine putting out in a hat the sausage roll is safe but now in response to or hashtagging that but now in response to a query from the Reuters news agency it has said that the temporary interruptions to supplies across the UK included vegan sausage rolls which were a massive hit because if you're not familiar with Greg's, they have this sausage roll, which is pictured above, which looks similar to the vegan anyway. And it's very, 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 very popular. I think it's like a pound, maybe 99p. And people love getting it, you know, for breakfast and shit, or maybe just to eat as a snack. Um, it's probably one of the better sausage rolls that you're going to get from like a store, especially one that's been pre-made. Um, and then over time, they decided to dip their toes into the vegan um, side of things. And they made the vegan sausage roll, which is as good, if not better than the sausage one. But the only issue is if you're an actual vegan going to a greg's to go eat vegan food makes doesn't make sense to me because i would imagine there's a lot of cross cross contamination that exists in there i'm not you know i don't i don't doubt for one minute that the guys and girls who work there you know are, are going to be really really keeping an eye on what utensils they're using to pick up the vegan and non-vegan stuff but maybe i'm wrong it continues um, some shops um, may not have had no some some shops may not have have not may not have them or may not have them uh, throughout the day it varies the spokesman said it's true the vegan sausage roll with corn filling was launched in 2019 has become a popular meat-free alternative to the chain traditional sausage roll or steak and chicken bakes okay is that the most popular ones there i didn't know that so sausage rolls popular and then steak and chicken bakes they're not that great the chicken one is a bit ugh, makes you want to throw up after a while chicken the chicken bake is like um is equivalent to like a meatball sandwich. You know what I mean, they're good after the they they're pretty nice at the first bite, but then by the time you get to the second and the third, you're already feeling a bit queasy. It continues. Supply chain disruptions have taken its toll across the economy with the impacts of the COVID nineteen and Brexit blamed for shortages of lorry drivers to transport goods around the world, as well as workers in meat processing factories. It has led to a reduced availability of some products from supermarkets such as Morrison's to fashion retailers, including Primark, as well as chicken shortages in Nando's. Oh yeah, true. People are suffering for the chicken out there. Greg's was um. Greg, which has recovered well after trading was severely disrupted during the pandemic lockdowns, first acknowledged in August that it was feeling the impact of the crisis with some products containing chicken missing from shelves. Last month, speaking after the company issued a statement, um, it's a trading update. Mr. Whiteside said the following, um, I wake up every morning and find out what's short that day because something has been disrupted. There's something different going on every day with something different item. And that's him, Roger Whiteside, right? Imagine you're working in Greg's as a flipping weekend staff guy and this guy comes strolling and ready to take some pictures. Because usually what happens, if you're, trust me, I've worked service industry jobs before on this level, working behind a till and shit in a cafe and whatnot. Usually they don't tell you when these guys are coming in, right? They, they, you guys are lowly, low level people. They don't let you know, especially if you've got a crappy manager that doesn't pass on a message. So you're minding your business, I don't know, catching your friends up with you know, whatever ketamine escapade you get up to on the weekend, talking about some girl you smashed, some guy you kissed, whatever you're talking some flagrant stuff on a shop floor whilst no one's there and then little do you know some guy walks up behind you who looks like that no one tells you who he is and then you know little do you know later on that he was not only the mystery shopper he was also the flipping chairman of the fucking company do you know what I mean or in this case the CEO you're like no I really need this 7.99 or this 7.50 or this seven pound exactly per hour job please don't fire me I need this I need the discounts too it continues, but he added the sausage roll is safe. It's one thing that we haven't got short of. However, Reuters reported that he had spotted number of stores in London that were out of vegan sausage rolls in the first half of the week. Bruv, I spoke earlier about the marine biologist that has to flip in, analyze, um, you know, Subway sandwiches to ascertain whether or not they have tuna in them. Imagine being a journalist and you're having to flip and go to Greg's to inspect whether or not they have fucking chicken or meat products on their shelves to add to your story about flipping supply chain disruptions. Like that is the height of like, let me give up my career and become some sort of flipping you know, star and only fans or something like that's just simply it's not worth it. If that's what you're going to go journalism school to do to inspect the shelves of a fucking Greg's, it's not worth it. But again, what do I know? What do I know? Next on the list and news that I've been eager to report on and news I've been eager to kind of just read myself. Popeye's in Westfield Stratford has finally opened. Yay. 
Yeah, yeah, yeah. As I mentioned before on the show, I'm a big fan of Popeyes. I've only been there once. I'm a big fan. <laughs> yeah. Um, and obviously Popeyes, like I said, has a special place in my heart because it was the first American fast food establishment I visited on my first lads holiday when I was about 18 to 19. Me and some friends of mine went on a big lads holiday to New York of all places. The home of Supreme, the home of skateboarding, the home of hip hop. Yeah, the home of streetwear in general. We had an absolute blast of a time. We drank 40s on the street. We smoked weed on the rooftops. <gasps> we did spray taint. We spray painted buildings and got chased by the police. <gasps> right? Some of us kissed girls in flipping Santos party. Was it was that Santos party house, right? That club? Santos party house or something, right? We did all that shit. It was amazing. We went to Mishka and bowled out. No, actually, the boys, no, the, the rest of the boys went to Mishka because I think one of the guys I was with was doing like a project or something with them. They went to Mishka and shit. Oh, man, what a great time. So, so anyway, I remember going to New York and obviously um, at the time, I was only one of the few people who actually decided to save some money to go because a lot of people just went with whatever money they had, they had, they had on their person. But then the benefit of, of going to a holiday like that when you're young and some people have money, some people don't, is that you will pull your resources. So if someone doesn't have too much money, you buy them a drink, you get them an entry to a club, you pay for their cloakroom, whatever you can to support, everyone's always chipping in. So it's always good. So everyone's covered. As long as you've got your accommodation, you're basically blessed. We'll jump in the bar balances and shit. It was just a fun time. So I remember when one night we were about to go out and we went to get some food to flip an eat and shit and i decided oh i want to go to popeyes um and this was but i think this might have been before the, the um, what was it oh, it was like it doesn't matter we went to popeyes for the first time i ordered like a box of like you know i think i got like a box of chicken tenders or something like that or chicken strips with some chips in it and i also got some or oh, some fries and I, it also came with like um with like a cookie thing or a biscuit thing i forgot what the name is called and that's some gravy right and I remember eating that and have only wanting, and again, in a massive drink. I remember the drink was fucking gargantuan size, right? Especially compared to what we have in the UK. I remember having three chicken strips and a couple of fries and I was four. And I literally handed the box over to my friends who didn't have anything to eat or who didn't, bother, who didn't want to go eat or didn't want to spend money. And legitimately, I turned around and that thing was feeding like six people. I was like, wow, man. The American portions are wild. Don't get me wrong, because you can get a box full of chicken in here in the UK. We are we are we are very well known, especially in London, for our flipping hot wings. But they're not to a level of what you can get in America. They're flipping, you know, little tiny nugget type shaped things. But their strips were like, you know, was that the size of my flipping forearm? Jeremy you know I mean? was a fucking massive, massive strip. I'm sure they call them boneless chicken wings, but they're not boneless chicken wings. It's basically a chicken tender. You know what I mean? Um, because technically a bonus chicken wing would be what? A chicken tender anyway. So I don't know why they think cool things bonus chicken tender is uh, strange. But anyway, regardless of that, but I think they just put the word bonus in the menu so that if you don't like bones and you're one of those weirdos, like, I don't like bones, I don't like pieces. Yeah, it feels squidgy in my mouth. Water, I don't like the taste of water. If you're not one of those flipping crybabies, then you're not going to get triggered by the word. Um, you're not going to get triggered by... Uh, yeah, you, if you're one of those babies, then maybe the word boneless is a good trigger point for you to then buy it because you know you don't have to think. You just have to keep biting and chucking into your you know, esophagus and you're fucking fine. You don't even chew. Straight into your esophagus. But anyway, continuing on, Popeyes is now open shop shop here. Here in London. And this is a review courtesy of The Mirror. It says, I went to the UK's first Popeyes and tried the chicken and sandwich that broke the internet. Do you remember that? There was a period in time, wasn't life simple back then? Before all the flipping racial tensions and the scandals online, all that sort of nonsense and kids shooting adults, you know, protests and whatnot and guys getting shot in their back as they're running away from their assailants, all this nonsense. It was a simple time where people were queuing and fighting outside of Popeye's chicken. There was a time where people were, remember there was a time, again, think about this, there was a time where people were reselling Popeye chicken sandwiches. I remember that. I remember reading and seeing videos of people in America saying that people were reselling Popeye's chicken sandwiches. There was videos of people in drive throughs queuing outside of Popeye's to get them. People were quitting their Popeye's jobs on the spot because customers are being rude and harassing them and all this sort of shit. Customers are fighting in the store. People were cutting in front of them in line and shit. It was a dark time, but a simple time, a much simpler time. Anyway, it continues. It says, when it comes to fast food restaurants, there are thousands of them. Dotted, Louisiana, Louisiana chicken chain. No, so it's from Louisiana. I didn't know that. Um, that's home of um, Fia Vaughan, isn't it? And um, Popeyes is setting up shop in Westfield Stratford Shopping Centre, opening a business on Saturday, November 20, and the fast food will also be available on Deliveroo. Hallelujah. Because who likes to go to fucking Westfield Stratford? Not me. Not me. Westfield Stratford is shopping malls like, 
I wish it was around when I was 18 because I would have loved it because that was what we did when I was younger. You'd get dressed up, you'd go to the shopping mall with two pounds to your name and you'd try and chat up girls unsuccessfully. You'd go to JD Sports and look at stuff you can't afford to buy. Go into Foot Locker and look at, stuff, look at stuff you definitely cannot afford to buy. And then you'd go home or you'd go back. Maybe if you had some money left or maybe if you actually had some money, you might get a haircut or you might go, actually what actually happened, you'd go get some chicken um, at, at flipping, you know, like a boss man or maybe at the during the time of you walking around the shopping mall someone will let you know and say hey shh, there's a house party happening down the street and you'd think you'd have to decide whether or not the house party was a setup whether it was an actual time to catch a good wine or catch a quick wine you don't know you don't know am i going to get rushed in someone's living room in the middle of Forest gate or am i going to be able to catch a quick wine off this little lighty What's going to happen? You don't know. You don't know. You don't know. <laughs> Let's continue here. It says customers will be able to get their hands on it um, for the menu. Sorry, including um, wings, bites, tenders, and an iconic chicken sandwich that broke the internet when it launched in 2019. As well as the chicken, the first ever Popeye's chicken. We also serve Cajun chips, mash. Wow. Mac and cheese, biscuits with Cajun gravy. That's what I got when I, when I went to New York. Um, they're also introducing a brand new and exclusive vegan burger, the Creole Red Bean Sandwich. Mama Mia. If it weren't enough, there's also a wide section of sauces accompanying the food, such as mango habanero in collaboration with Megan Thee Stallion on a hot sauce called Hottie. Mate, isn't that the biggest load of bullshit ever? Why are all these hot um, rapper girls selling us fast food? You don't eat that shit. You can't look like Megan Thee Stallion and Sweetie. You can't be that attractive, that well built, that well endowed, right, body wise, and be eating Popeyes and McDonald's every single day. I don't believe it. I refuse to believe it. Not even every single day. Maybe every other weekend, you're not eating it. Why are they lying to us? Or not us, to the girls specifically. And why do girls lap that shit up? I never, I've, it never really made sense to me. Like, why, like, a really fit and trim former gymnast former supermodel girl on instagram that also sells um books on how to lose weight has 120 has like 1.7 million followers like why her advice is kind of not flawed but it's a bit it's a bit it's a bit like pointless she's got a base of athletic athletics in her family or she's an athlete herself she spent most of her life you know earning money looking hot in front of a camera being a supermodel how is she going to give you any advice or any kind of inkling into what it means to lose weight or what it means to be a little bit rotund to be a little bit fluffy and edgy she has no experience of it she's been like I me mean, she's there's never been a, a day in her life where she hasn't had a six-pack and here she is selling you a guide on how to look good in the bikini come on give do yourself a favor give your head a wobble it continues with mirrors courtney Puchin was invited what's her name courtney Puchin. Courtney Pochin was invited down to head of the launch. Here's what she thought. Um, she said until last weekend, you probably said duh, 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 repeating the same thing. Um, the CEO says something. Let's talk about the food. Uh, duh, duh, duh. It says here the quote at Popeyes, we focus on the quality and ingredients. Cool, I guess you do. It says here um, these things. Duh, duh. Okay, there. There's one. Then there's good mayo pickles and a crucial part. I think the components keep it on the super simple. It's focus on the quality and keep the price right at four ninety five, which is a fucking good price for a chicken sandwich because a regular chicken sandwich from a boss man is probably about the same size, probably about the same price. Maybe, maybe it's three ninety five. You're not gonna get a chicken burger for that much cheaper. Chicken sandwich was definitely an upgrade on my regular, on your average fast food fare. And I'd even go as far as saying the claim is better than McDonald's. Sorry, the chicken sandwich or the KFC Philip burger. I'm already craving another one. Wow. That's a big, big um, endorsement because chicken burgers here in the UK aren't that great, especially especially ones that, you know, from the hood and shit, from like a boss man. But the ones that are usually the standard bearers are KFC. They've got a sick, sick, sick chicken sandwich. I think so. I've not actually tried the, the McDonald's one, but the, the KFC fillet burger is fucking not banging. That mini fillet already is fucking really good. So I, just imagine what the KFC burgers are when you add the top of the, 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 the Zinger top, whatever it is, whatever. Those ones are really nice as well. So if this is better than the KFC one, this is definitely really, really good. And for 4 95 oof. It says once Popeye opens, you'll be able to try it for yourself with a classic spicy sandwich price at four ninety five or seven ninety five with a meal and a regular side. But yeah, look at that food. Look how much you get there. That's a big portion of food. That's why I ordered when I went to New York on my own. Did I mention I went to New York? <laughs> um, it continues as well as giving chicken sandwich a try. Peter Gainer 
The director of the Global Canary Division and Product Development Popeyes uh, recommends um, ordering the signature Louisiana chicken with a pot of Mardi Gras mustard and a lattice biscoche, biscoff shake to wash it down. Oh, oh, that's that biscuit, isn't it? That, that's that biscuit. That's that um, nice. They've got a shake made of that biscuit. Oh, oh, oh it's good. The signature chicken meal, five ninety five for a two piece, contains chicken on the bone, marinated for twelve hours in the company's signature blend of Louisiana herbs and spices on one side, one drink, and one biscuit. And if you're getting biscuits, then simply just must order a pot of Cajun gravy to go with it. Biscuits and gravy are incredibly popular in the U.S., but the concept is bound to baffle some customers here. Once you get over the initial feeling of the amusement, drown your plate in Cajun gravy. But yeah, you can see that chicken's good. That's definitely an upgrade to what you get from a boss man because that doesn't look like it's oiling up the. Tr- the, the, the paper one of the things that's a you know unfortunate about a boss man chicken is that it's fucking soggy as fucking you know the bottom of your fucking box is absolutely see-through but this you can tell it's dry it's crispy but it still looks succulent i already want some already what's the verdict it says she says here ultimately i would say popeye's convert she said i was a popeye's convert i'm excited for everyone to have a chance to taste it i like how she keeps mentioning she got to try it before in it like subliminally it said the prices are pretty generous for the portion sizes and the fried chicken was super crunchy and full of flavor with the hot wings of spicy sandwiches packing a real kick. I love the Popeyes is staying true to its American roots and offering customers something that's familiar but also completely different with more usual with more unusual items on the menu like biscuits and gravy. And also it's worth noting that the company, while being an iconic American brand, is going to be sourcing 95% of its ingredients locally in the UK instead of importing to the US. They've also signed a better chicken commitment which aims to improve the lives of chicken fuck off dude dude honestly give yourself a fucking a head wobble like what is this is this chicken rights or some shit is this what we're we're talking about come on if you enjoy yeah okay cool but yeah i'm definitely gonna go check it out and then of course the sun burn the sun murderers scumbags but anyway this is a kind of a, a check on the the collection and what it looks like i'm assuming that's some sort of shake that's a burger the biscuit with the pie i think that's a mash maybe that's a mash that's a gravy more chicken stuff here pieces tenders blah 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 you know the deal you know the vibe chicken from popeye's coming at you very very soon get involved don't delay Today, baby, one second, I blow my nose. Oh, mate, my hay fever is kicking my ass, kicking my ass, kicking my ass. But yeah, let's move on. Let's move on. Let's get back into this beavers. So, next topic to come into, and something that I've been eager on the edge of my seat to talk about, and I'm so excited to hear what some of you guys have to say about this quite interesting development, but something that I'm not too surprised about. So, as I reported on my on my podcast the other day, um, Daniel Lee, the former head creative director of Bottega Veneta, the guy that was basically responsible for reviving that brand and bringing it back into the cultural zeitgeist, making it a must-have item in any fashion fan's wardrobe, had been let go, fired, walked away, something happened over the last couple of weeks and everyone was kind of, you know, everyone in the kind of fashion Twitter space or the fashion social media space was like, huh, this is nuts. How's the guy responsible for reviving a brand and the one solely responsible for obviously increasing its sales and revenue, that sort of shit, leaving now, especially now where it's just about to get good. What is that? How does that make any sense? But then I was thinking myself, when I read the statement and saw the leaks that were coming out or maybe some of the reports and I saw some passive aggressive post from a supporter of the now um, creative director of Bottega Veneta, Matteo Blasi. Um, there was a there's a woman, I forgot who it was, some verified lady who left some comment underneath his post where he basically said, I've got the job, where she said something like, oh, um, that is congratulations, um, much well-deserved for like a great guy who's respectful, who treats his colleagues with respect, like loads of those kind of like um, subliminals that she was throwing out and made me think, hmm, did Daniel Lee was either, Daniel Lee was not that well-regarded behind the scenes, he was a bit of a prick and everyone didn't like him and it's like good riddance, or he didn't leave, you know, under his own accord and he actually left because he was probably going to get fired because of something he might have done behind the scenes that people didn't like and hence why the rush to appoint somebody in-house instead of going and sourcing somebody away to kind of move things onwards because, you know, they just went to continue like the, uh, whatever, you get the point, right? So that's what people were kind of hypothesizing and kind of figuring out away from it. But 
the news kind of died down. It felt like about the the kind of rumors as to why Daniel Lee wasn't at Bottega Veneta anymore because everyone it looks like in fashion was big fans of this Matteo Blazy guy. Maybe because of his relationship um, with the I forgot the other designer that he's kind of relationship with, or maybe because fashion people knew behind the scenes that he was actually the person responsible for the magic at um, Bottega Veneta, or maybe they were very aware of his work that he did at Celine and what he did at Maison Margiela. But a lot of fashion people that I followed that I respect were very enthusiastic about the new appointment of creative director Abatek Vanessa and the Daniel Lee news kind of was pushed aside everyone kind of forgot about it and moved on but I was still interested I was still curious why did this guy leave it doesn't make any sense and also I was curious what's the next steps somebody as talented as he is or who has the ability to kind of you know revive brands like that and have such a discernible code or style that he kind of imbued or aesthetic that he was able to kind of weave into Bottega Veneta you would imagine that another brand would want to kind of you know snap him up quite quickly or do you want to maybe capitalize on his kind of notoriety and his fame and maybe launch his own namesake brand you'd imagine that so right you'd imagine well it looks like that namesake brand unless it's called what he basically called someone in the meeting, it's going to be very, very long before we heard that namesake brand being launched. Because um, according to this fashion insider called Luis Pisano, who I follow on Twitter, Luis Pisano, I think he's a French dude. Um, he, you know, he's, he's a good follower on social media in general, a bit of a fun, outspoken kind of guy. And he said the following, allegedly, and this comes from an incredibly close to the matter and reliable source Daniel Lee was promptly fired by Francois Henri Pinot after he allegedly called somebody a fucking nigger in a meeting at Bottega Veneta <laughs> I repeat Daniel Lee the guy that was pandering to all the blacks the guy that all my cool black fashion friends were sucking off and you know happy that he could call him friend and they got invited to shows and they were posting pics of their invite and taking pictures of their feet with their tire boots and their puddle shoes and their bags and their jackets and their jumpers and you know posting pictures of them outside the shop with the massive green bag shopping blowing a bag maybe getting stuff on discount it doesn't matter just enjoying the Bottega Veneta lifestyle loving every minute of it all those people that were just yeah he is for the culture because he put some big girl on the flipping advertisement somewhere or because he put this black guy with dreads on there whatever right yeah he's for the culture yeah yeah for the culture this same guy allegedly and this comes from an incredibly close source according to Luis Pizano on Twitter said to the matter and a reliable source Daniel Lee was promptly fired by Francois Henri Benoit, the guy that Kanye name drops, right? The head of caring or that whole flipping, you know, whatever group conglomerate you call it, right? Is that the same person? It is the same person, right? I'm sure it's the same person. After he allegedly called somebody a fucking nigger in a meeting at Bottega Veneta. The first thing I want to know, what's all all hands meeting, right? Would require you to call anybody a fucking anything. Usually fucking when you're like saying it in like a meeting way. Usually, yeah, usually even the word fucking itself in a meeting is something that would kind of catch the breath of everybody. Everybody like, oh, he said the F word. You say it outside of the outside of the meeting room. You obviously say it with your colleagues when you're on a night out having a couple of drinks, right? But you say it in a meeting room when you're having a, 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 an all hands, a company all hands, or you're trying to sort out something for whatever. I don't know, whatever. Or even a stand-up. People are going to look at you like, this guy's a psycho. So imagine adding the flipping nigger with the ER at the end of it. So not only you swore amongst your colleagues in front of your colleagues, you know, to a, a fellow staff member or to an employee or to somebody that you hired personally. Not only do you do that, you also call them an ER at the end. An ER. Are you insane, bruv? Are you insane? And this is the guy that everyone was flipping, jacking off and saying he was doing this for the culture, doing that for the culture. Again, man, we are, we are easy people to please, isn't it? Put a couple of black people in the runway, right? Yeah, he's a sea of caring. I knew that's what Francois and Pinot, Pin um, a very wealthy man, right? How much did he worth? This Francois, it doesn't matter. But anyway, we are easy people to please, isn't it? Right? You put a couple of people that look like us on the runway. You maybe hire some people behind the scenes to do some seeding. Maybe send a couple of people some free heels and free bags. Maybe put them in a runway show. Maybe re maybe kind of you know like an image they shared. Get them to handle social media. Whatever it may be, just some peripheral stuff. Nothing that's actually going to change the gears and the kind of you know 
power dynamics that exist in the fashion industry just kind of you know the kind of peripheral stuff right you get maybe someone that you you know someone from out some, someone from the black community quote unquote to do the flipping door and after party and now suddenly you are a flipping um an ally a friend and something it's like it's garbage it's all garbage it's all lip service it's always been lip service and i've never believed it which is why i've generally in my opinion for all the kind of moral um ideologically based posturing that all these fashion brands do is empty and hollow because guess what most fashion people are empty and hollow too it's the whole point of it if you're in fashion you're essentially committing to a life of superfluous um you know consumption right you have to justify the fact that you want to get this luebe um, new season um knee length flipping coat even though you've got another one from the past season because it's fashion none of it makes sense there's nothing sustainable about buying 17 p coats but you do it anyway because you love it same with me i do the same thing how many flipping black jackets do i have how many rick owen pants do i own how many is enough how many geo baskets does one man need before he says enough's enough but i'm gonna do it myself and i'm a hypocrite but i know it i know i'm a hypocrite i know i chat shit i know i don't stand for anything for the most part which is why i'm trying to change and i'm trying to actually have some sort of moral backbone have some sort of principles but these fashion brands they pretend and lie that they do they act like they do they do lip service they put a black square up on their flipping grid and since then what's changed who have you hired in a position of power in your company from the black community no one you but you put up a square all right cool brilliant you booked one of my mates to dj after party great amazing over the moon at that come on man which is why i appreciate brands or i appreciate designers like hedy Slimane at saint laurent paris right for a long period of time it, it, no he got kicked he, he got dragged kicking and screaming just to put skinny young black kids in his runway he didn't even care about that. He just wanted it to be all white. He was an all Aryan race runway. I you just I'm about I'm about the clothes. I don't represent the scene. I love he, bruv. Hedy Simon is probably still listening to Vampire Weekend to this day. He probably still bangs Arctic Monkey in his office to this day. The kinks, the kooks. He's listened to that shit all this day. So those guys are his idols. He just wants an all white, all white cast, bruv. That's what he's want. Then it took some time, some prodding and prodding, some some encouragement, some maybe some public embarrassment, some teasing online. And then of course he kind of acquiesced and said, okay, I'll include a couple of black TikTokers. Cool. You know, let's get them in there. But they all look the same. Skinny guys, that's what he loves. And he just puts out clothes. No political messages. Maybe there are some political undertones there, I'm sure, in the themes and the motifs and the locations, the way he does his shows nowadays, especially with Celine. I'm sure there's political and socioeconomical flipping, you know, things that you can pull away from it. But for the most part, he's just selling you clothes. Clothes. Rick Owens, the same thing. Yes, there are some ties to his, you know, his interesting background and his kind of uh, identity and his journey in fashion and his interest and his, you know, his taste level and what he's into movies. And I'm sure. But for the most part, it's just close. Demna for a long time. Oh, this guy's being too ironic. He's taking the piss, stereotypes, all this stuff. At the end of the day, he just makes great clothes. No real overt crazy political message because the guys that scream the most about all that shit are probably the ones that have the most skeletons in their cupboard. And look, allegedly, the guy Daniel Lee, the one that just did a show in flipping uh, Motor City, he went to Detroit, the home of techno, right? Hired Carl Craig to do the fucking soundtrack. Was it Carl Craig? Was it Carl Craig? What's his name? Is it Carl Craig? Am I mistaken? Is it Carl Craig did the soundtrack? One, is it Carl Craig? He must have done it Carl Craig. Let me double check. Was it Carl Craig? That did the soundtrack of, uh, of Bottega Veneta at Detroit. I'm pretty sure it was. I'm pretty sure it was Carl Craig. Carl Craig. Uh, uh, yeah, it was Carl Craig. It was, yeah, it was. He hired Carl Craig to do the flipping um, soundtrack or to do the, you know, the soundscape or whatever of the show there. He had a, 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 a cast full of people from all over the world, you know, people with you know that looked racially ambiguous cut he checked check, ticked every box the clothes were fucking garbage just be honest about it no one wants to talk about that the recent show was fucking shit but he ticked every show he ticked every box sorry he you know he transferred his entire show entire team over there to detroit and look what happened in the end in the end he got fired because allegedly he called uh, somebody that works for him in a meeting in a meeting People kicked off about what um, what's the name did what um, John Galliano did in that cafe, right? Those famous um, anti-Semitic flipping comments that he made. But he was out. He was outside somewhere. At least he was being antagonized by like a stranger. Again, 
no one justifying what the fuck he was saying but he was involved in some sort of verbal altercation with somebody outside and he decided to go for the old anti-semite uh, you know anti-semite insults in order to get a one-up and then obviously lost his entire career for a short period of time and lost his mind and then came back and walked straight back into a very high level job but we'll talk about that another time right but at least there was someone you know outside you had an argument with what could somebody have possibly done in a meeting that would um, elicit somebody like a Daniel Lee to say something like that in front of them? And also, how comfortable does someone like a Daniel Lee feel who flipping looks like that, right? Somebody that looks like that would feel comfortable enough to call somebody else a nigger. Like in a meeting, bruv, this, this is basically the fault. And again, this I lay the fault at the feet of people around him who enabled him, let, let him feel like he could walk around with his chest held up high, like his shit didn't stink, like he was the big bee's knees. You enabled this guy. That, and fashion does this all the time. They enable, they gas up, they pour flipping essentially um, gasoline on a fire because they want to see more magic, more sparks, more, more, more. And in the moment it gets too crazy, they all kind of back away like, oh, I didn't know it was going to get this crazy. It's like, fuck off, man. You enabled this guy. You enabled him. You enabled him. I'm sure this isn't the first, again, maybe it's the first time he said something racial, allegedly, but this can't be the first time he's got into some sort of fracas or got in some sort of like tit for tat with somebody. I'm sure, again, I'm not in the scene. I'm not in the industry. I don't have any behind the scenes information. I'm happy about that. The only connection I have to fashion is the fact that I went to a fashion school in Central St. Martins, but I studied product design there. I didn't study anything to do with fashion. And apart from that, I enjoy it from a distance. I buy the magazines that all you motherfuckers buy. I read the same sites. I watch the same documentaries i follow the same people on social media but i don't go anywhere near those guys anywhere near them because they're flipping toxic toxic individuals and there's this horrible kind of like hush hush don't talk about this sort of culture that i hate as well one of the main guys or well, main guys another another thing that i wanted to point out quickly because of that hush hush thing what's his name um that that uh what's his face that bibby guy what's his name is it bibby what's his face there's, there's a black fashion fair um He's somebody that was incredibly vocal about some of the stuff that Virgil was getting up to during the pandemic times. I think, was it during the, the, the kind of the, um, the reaction to like the George Floyd death? You remember when Virgil was doing some nonsense with that? I forgot what he did. Maybe it was, it was a $50 um, donation or something, right? Then there was that flipping screenshot of him talking to Shim Timothy Chamelay and saying that he's going to solve racism. Remember all that nonsense? He was here and along with the other people were quite critical of Virgil. Oh, you didn't do that. You didn't do this. Ah. You know, calling him out of his name, all this stuff. Okay, cool. Warranted, maybe deserved, maybe over, over egged, but whatever. Everyone did, everyone did it. I think I even commented it myself. Cool. Then this situation happens, right? With flipping Daniel Lee, allegedly, right? It's the news of the town, it's all over the place. And this same guy, right? This Bibi, what's his name? Bibi Gregory, um, who's the founder of the Black Fashion Fair, does amazing stuff. The Black Fashion Fair has gone from success to success. He's also involved with um, Theophilo, um, that incredible brand. He's, he says here from his, um, into his Twitter, he's a brand director there. He had a lot of things to say about that sort of stuff. And again, he's a very strong proponent of um, Bottega Veneta. Yeah, I think he was one of the first people I saw on social wearing the, the puddle boots. And I think he's got a pair of the tire boots and shit. He's always showing them in fits. They look great with these flipping big, wide, baggy pants you know great looks hasn't said a word about it directly the only one thing he said about it on his twitter page about it again again the hypocrisy of fashion people is just it never never baffles me so virgil gets many tweets directed at him about the thing that he did which obviously was you know at the time insensitive maybe a bit lame maybe whatever but again look back on it a little bit of a reaction in that regard this is a alleged incident that allegedly happened that people are saying and again, this is a, a black person saying it too. It's not some random white person coming out and saying it. And again, the, the sad thing also is that it's not even a black person that works in the company saying it. That black person that maybe, allegedly, had that said to them is so scared to come out and say it because they know that if they do come out and say it again, because I'm, I'm pissed off about it. If, if, if it was me, I would come out and say it. But I'm, I'm a flipping reckless um, kamikaze type of guy. I mean, I'm ranting and raving here in my apartment on my own sweating. Do you know what I mean? I don't, you know what I mean? I'm not the best kind of um, guy for that kind of advice. But if you, know, if you want to actually have a, a career in fashion, you can't come out and say this, right? You can't come out and basically open and basically, you know, uh, spill the tea because it's going to ruin your chances in fashion altogether because people are going to think that you're a bit of a tattletale and it's going to you know curtail your career and you'll never be seen again so that's a sad thing but again a black guy came out and said this allegedly this happened and it's big big had a lot to say about virgil and look what he says about flipping daniel lee it's been over 20 years and people still believe tommy hilfiger went on oprah and made racially charged comments 
people believe what the, he said. Um, people believe that he said he didn't want. No, people say he didn't want black and Asian people wearing his clothes. He never said this. And I said that to say whether it's true or not, the damage is already done. So he didn't even address it directly. He didn't say the name, but take it. This everything about Daniel Lee says some roundabout thing about Tommy Hilfiger, some story from yesteryears that's been forgotten about and moved on. And he used that as an excuse to not comment on it because guess what? You want to protect your relationships, isn't it? You want to protect your relationships. Absolutely disgusting. And again, it's just pick and choose. Pick and choose. Because what? He was somebody that was well regarded in the industry because Bottega Veneta has got the lens because of caring. Like, awful, 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 awful. And again, who knows if it's true? It could be all false. It could be all made up. But I just can't believe that somebody in that office let somebody with a chest that looks like that, right? A little bird chest. It's funny, though, because I think when he took that picture, he generally thought he was going to look like Daniel Craig, isn't it, right? This picture here. That's what he thought he was going for. He thought he was going to look like that. But in actuality, Daniel Lee looks like that. Uh, he looks much better with a t-shirt on. Here he looks really handsome. But the other one, he's got a kind of, he's got, you've got to put a shirt on, brother. You've got to put a shirt on. But yeah, um, a guy like that was the one that did that. And again, we shouldn't be surprised, isn't it? We shouldn't be surprised. He's the one that went to Bergheim, did that thing at the height of the pandemic, didn't say sorry. You know, they had a police investigation opened up on Bottega Veneta. Like loads of, it's caused them a lot of drama. So I'm not surprised that they said, you know what, let's get this absolute dimwit out of this building ASAP. Um, but where's the, what's the thing I wanted to show you about the, oh yeah, this is the thing. And I remember talking about the whole pandering thing, which kind of touches on what Brian Boy said, um, in July that he got absolutely ripped for on social media. I think some people are saying that, oh, Brian Boy can't talk about it. I, I don't know what the issue is with Brian Boy on social media. People need to educate me on this. It seems like Brian Boy can't talk when it comes to certain issues with certain people. They don't really like him. I don't know why. Um, he's, don't get me wrong. He's not the most likable person in the world his whole kind of um rich woman rich uh wife stick thing is a bit cringe and a bit annoying after a while uh yeah you know what i mean it is what it is but you know he's a, he's a decent follow whatever it may be um and he said he said i think sometime in july and i think i was saying the same thing just in general in fashion when it came to just the over if it, it felt like abundance of flipping black people singing and dancing and jumping and ah ah and dreads everywhere on fashion shows like on billboards like well this is gross what are you guys doing are you trying to convince us that you like black people you obviously don't we and, and again we don't care because black people just buy the clothes anyway there's plenty of people buying dolce gabbana they don't really care that maybe you know the founders of dolce gabbana are probably gonna spit on you if you're on fire and shit but they don't care they just wear the clothes but this whole like you know, moral posturing, whatever it may be, or it's just, it's just gross. And I called it out back then myself privately, but I think, um, but uh, what's his name? Brian Boy put it on wax, but then of course he got shook again, the fashion thing, delete his tweet like a baby um, and ran away from it. But he basically said, you know, Daniel Lewis pandering to black people. And I was saying the same thing just in general about the fashion scene. And I made this tweet in August, um, which kind of talks about, oh no, the, the tweet in August was in relation to this advert um, with Tiffany's and I think this had to do with the same time when Jay-Z and Beyonce did that collection with Tiffany's too or were in the advert for it or whatever it may be and they did a little shoot they did with um, Alton Mason again the another go-to uh, black fashion guy that everyone kind of uses on their run on their runway right dark skin guy really good looking and um, looks looks amazing in clothes moves amazing on the runway get him on the runway in the front row or get him to kind of open the shows so people think that you like black people do you know what I mean always the nonsense and for whatever reason they got him to do this stuff where he's fucking break dancing for Tiffany's and co right and this is a tweet I read that says not sure how I feel about this luxury brands like Bottega Veneta and Tiffany and co pandering to black people there's no point in having us break dancing and pop shoving all over the place when no one that looks like us is working in the head office which is you know basically true and the video itself um i'm not gonna hopefully the, the music doesn't play because it's nas tune it's out of mason in the basketball courtyard somewhere doing his standard back, back flips and you know oh get off flips and stuff and break dance moves for tiffany and co right wearing a tuxedo and kids around him are skateboarding and pop shoving and kick flipping all over the place and the thing that makes it funny is that number one it's for Tiffany and Co. And they're doing this in a project somewhere in America. Most people in those kind of buildings next to there can't even afford to keep the lights on or are struggling to flip and put food in their kids' plates. And yet they've got a brand in their courtyard doing these flips and flips and whatnot. And one of their earrings probably costs the, you know, the entirety of what their rent would cost for an entire year. The second other thing about it is that Alta Mesa is doing flips and kicks and stuff in a tuxedo for Tiffany. Don't make that sense. And the other thing that's really interesting about it is that they're trying to market this to like, what, an urban clientele when you know, 
you know yourself, if you was to rock up to a Tiffany's and co, looking the way that I do, carrying a skateboard, maybe just even wearing the stuff that I am now with the tracksuit bottoms and just looking scruffy and shit, you would have a security guard following you the entirety of the time that you're in there. And if you've ever been to a Tiffany and co store, they're not that big. The security guard would be following you and letting it be known that I am watching you. That's how they would make you feel. But here they are in these adverts trying to make it seem that they're down with the culture and stuff and they're for the people. Get the fuck out of here. Make me my diamonds. Make me my, my Cuban Sarko, so Cubans, whatever the words are. Do you know what I mean? Make me my little clip-on earrings. Make my rings. Make my bracelets. And let me go on my way. Give me my little Tiffany blue bag. And let me clap myself up as I'm on a train. Impress some strangers. Whilst I put the little bag on my lap. And yet they don't know that I just got the cheapest thing in the store. Don't push it to me. I don't care. Because I know you're all full of bullshit. And I think this Daniel Lee story is definitely the epitome of it. But again, thoughts and feelings go out to whoever the guy was or girl who was at the end of that racial tirade, that horrible racial tirade, allegedly that happened, supposedly that happened. And then Kering themselves come out and responded to this. They responded to this flat out and said that wasn't true. And probably the reason why they responded to this wasn't true because... Then at least still a prized commodity. They probably still want to shuffle him inside of carrying somewhere and put him into another brand anyway, because there's a dearth or there's a lack of like designers at that level who can move the needle, who can, you know, if he gets hired to another brand, he's bringing with him an, an inbuilt audience. No, he's, he's, he's bringing over an audience with him, which brands obviously love, right? Um, he's going to be able to sell out stuff and they're going to change things and they'll be able to be more contemporary and get with the kids and whatnot. So I understand why Kering are trying to protect their investment in one way and also understand on their point from a brand wise, if they come out and say that was true and it kind of gets uncovered, that there were other instances of Daniel Lee's um, supposed, alleged verbal <laughs> racial tirades at people, it's going to make them look worse too because it, it means that what? What was the... Why was this the straw that broke the camel's back? Why didn't you let go of him when he said that other thing to someone else, that other thing to somebody else? So, you know what I mean? It continues, it continues. Anyway, it says the following. The cut, it says here, Karen responds to allegations against ex Bottega Veneta designer. Ever since the news broke last week, designer Daniel Lee suddenly pairing ways um, where he served as creative director for three years and being replaced by uh, Matteo Blasi uh, from within. Some couldn't help but wonder what had the heck happened in the press release. Um, last week, the Italian fashion house said in the end of his collaboration with Lee was a joint decision. See, they said joint decision, which makes me believe it was definitely um, gross misconduct because usually at that level if you've got gross misconduct on you you can negotiate a way to kind of get out the contract without leaving so you don't rep ruin reputation also like again if they want to reshuffle you inside their own little corporation or conglomerate or whatever it may be called they can do so as well you know it continues says, however on Wednesday night fashion writer Luis Pisano tweeted the following da -da -da. early Thursday morning Kerry responded on Twitter saying we deny what you've been told and what you have shared about the reasons of the departure of Daniel Lee from Protective Veneta very cold very dry right so it's obviously them either defending Daniel Lee or it's them basically saying you can get away with saying supposed alleged racist things to your employees um, you know, with reckless abandon and these big corporations will protect you because you're able to sell a couple of puddle boots. Like, it's pretty disgusting if you think about it. Like, think about it in that way. Um, especially if you're somebody that works at Bottega Veneta or you work at Kering and you're black. Think about what that says to you, that these companies are willing to come out, make a statement about that, you know, and say, no, nah, he didn't say that. He didn't, he didn't. You're lying, you're lying, you're lying. Um, and basically gaslight you and make you, put you in a position where you can't, um, come out and talk about any other grievances that you have but again anyone that let you know I, again anyone that let somebody with the chest like this say that you know i don't know man i don't know that's when you know you're indoctrinated with fashion if you let somebody that looks like this come out and say that to you like i don't know he looks like he's like five foot two or something as well like really like come on man you let a man that looks like that say that to you about just because you want to wear a couple of pairs of don't get me wrong the boots are sick I'm still gonna, I'm still probably gonna wear the boots. I'm I'm not the best guy when it comes to all that sort of shit. Like I said, I don't like political posturing, but I'm just thinking. Oh, sorry, I don't like um posturing in general. But I'm just thinking when it comes to people and stuff like all my friends that were out there fucking jocking this brand and acting really holier, bigger than Dan, right? Because they got invited to these shows and stuff with this guy. And look what he says about us behind closed doors, bruv. Look what he actually thinks about us when he gets angry, when he gets in the mood. Because again, it's like with these streamers online. They get angry 
They get frustrated with the game. It's like, nigga! Do you know what I mean? That's what the first thing they scream. Nigga, nigga, nigga. It's like, why is that the first word that comes out of your mouth when you're frustrated or when you want to illustrate your frustration vocally? Or you want, yeah, you, you, you want to vocalize your frustration. The first thing that comes out of your mouth is nigger. N- with the ER as well. Not, not the nigger. Not, not, the, not, the, not the YG nigger, right? Not the LA nigger. But the flippant nigger. Like, God damn it, man. You guys are crazy. But again... Here we are, innit? Who knows if it's true? Who knows if it isn't? It'd be just to see. But the question I want to know, will everyone burn their puddle boots and their tyre boots? Will there be a mass protest and a bonfire of people chucking all their protective and stuff into a bonfire and saying enough with that brand? Or will you all just pretend it didn't happen and quietly buy up all the stuff from Blasey when that eventually does drop? I know what the answer is. You know what the answer is. That's why fashion people are full of shit. But again, no surprise. No surprise. I'm not surprised that they're full of shit. Um, next on the list, let's move on. Talk about some club stuff because why not? Oh, yeah, let's talk about some club stuff. So, club, 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 club stuff. As you remember, did you remember, remember, you remember? There was a massive scandal happened. What? Massive scandal? It wasn't even a massive scandal. Looking back on it again, scandals. These things, these all, all these things that happen in society or happening, especially in culture, stuff that I look at. You look back on it and you think to yourself, this was something that actually affected people. It was making people argue in the comments. People maybe fell out with their friends. People unfollowed certain people about, you know, based on their views on where they stood and how they said a certain thing. But then you look back on it and you're like, this is a nonsense. And this is a good example. That whole um, kind of kerfuffle that happened with Revere Sudus, um, formerly known as Griesmüller, where this one dude, uh, this black guy from Berlin, was basically alleging that he suffered um, some racism and homophobia because of how he was um, dealt with or addressed when he was out there raving in Revere Sudus. Um, it came, I think the argument started because he didn't have a face mask on and he argued he didn't have a face mask because he was having a breather, he was having a sip of drink. Um, the security guards were getting very angsty the back and forth got really tetchy to the point where he got chucked out to the point where he made the five minute i think video explaining his case or something or 10 minute five minute video that then led to people kind of hounding river sudus um accusing them of racism accusing them of homophobia and then they promptly decided to close i think they closed obviously in part because of those allegations but also maybe in part because if i remember correctly that was a didn't oxo club close around the same time too because I think those clubs are, at the time, were open air. Because obviously with the pandemic regulations, so they had to, you know, do their parties open air. And I guess they're in residential areas or getting clubs with neighbours. I don't know what the issue was. But anyway, they closed off the back of that backlash. And again, a lot of people's gigs, a lot of people's, you know, employment at that time during a very, you know, touchy time was off the radar. I know a couple of people who are due to play there who are actually from the UK who gigs got cancelled so you can only imagine how that must have felt off the back of one person's complaint that allegedly a club in berlin was homophobic racist okay racism still i don't believe but let's uh, racism i can kind of entertain you with homophobic nightclub in berlin like you wouldn't survive like you'd have to be where would you have to, where would i have to be would have to be maybe in the center or something like even then like it's just it's just impossible in a city like berlin but again he said it damage was done and then you know river Sudus went and did some soul searching they put out a couple statements one of them weren't, wasn't that well received then they did i think a, some sort of um what did they do that's like a panel discussion or some sort of meeting they did something behind the scenes to kind of get to the heart of what the issue was address some of the concerns and try and do better because again it's a new club it's obviously not a new club because it's the same club as grease Mueller, but they're basically rebranding they're just starting the last thing you want look at what's happening to flipping about blank and they've got long and storied reputation in the night in the scene but the last thing you need is this smudge or this cloud hanging over your head you don't need people kind of taking political stances against coming to a nightclub especially it's already hard enough as it is um imagine on the back of a pandemic getting people to kind of give you a fair shot so they try their best and now it looks like they've come out from it out the other side with a message that is pretty heartfelt i think and kind of addresses and kind of i think i think speaks to some of the issues and hopefully puts it to bed so they can kind of move on and just get to what they're doing best in it programming good nights putting on good parties having a banging sound system all that stuff I, i'm actually curious to see what it's going to be like on the inside because it opened i, I think the inside opened maybe during the beginning of the pandemic, when the, when the inside open, actually, I don't think maybe I don't think anyone's been in the inside yet. No, I don't think anyone's been in the inside. I think everyone's been to the open air bit, but I don't think the actual inside has had, has had people in it yet. If I don't think so, 
I don't actually think so. So this might be the actual first time the actual indoors is open. So I'm actually curious to see what it's going to feel like. I'm hopefully going to be there even December or January again in Berlin. So fingers crossed. Once I go out there, I'll have time to go out there. Because again, I'm always fucking stuck in Bergheim. But again, let's move on to the message that they posted. So it says here, yeah, message to all these employees. And we aim, uh, the, the, we aim to be a club where everyone feels welcome and can party without reference to skin color, sexual orientation, gender or origin and creating a safer space for our scene. The most recent incidences at River Sudus, is that how you say it, right? Rivier Sudus or, R or Rivier Sodus? I don't know how you say it. Tell me in the comments. Made it clearly evident that we are not meeting our own standard. This is why we hit the spot stop button on all our events communication um and taking the time to listen reflect and learn about the organization individuals and again you can't ask for more than that i thought this was a bit much anyway i don't think they needed to do all this sort of shit but again considering how tightly knit the berlin scene is considering how you know um uh, clicky it is as well it was very um the, there was also the possibility that people could just protest and just not come and spread the word and picketed, picketing and outside of your club and that's not a visual that anyone wants so stopping everything and just actually trying to sit down and talk to these people who clearly don't think that you're meeting your st own standards or their standards and then get into a, a middle ground was maybe the right thing to go it continues here it says we have sat down with those um who video those we sat down with those whose video triggered this process, okay, including Nicholas Rose, that's the main guy, that's the dude that was obviously complaining, to say sorry in person for the experience that they had at RSO and to better understand their perspective. This helped us a lot in the process. We also want to apologize to each and every one of our guests who have experienced any form of wrongdoing, harassment or discrimination at our venue. Since we started Grease Mueller in 2019, sorry, 2011, our ambition has always um, been to make everyone feel welcomed. Queer events have always been a cornerstone of our program. That's why we worked very hard over the months to better fulfill ambition that's why I really, that's why i was honestly thinking that's why that nicholas rose video was a little bit disingenuous because it was like fair enough you had a bad experience with one person cool maybe two people but that doesn't maybe three maybe four but it doesn't speak for the overall establishment and the people behind it because like i said i know about grief simulator because of cocktail diamore which is the probably the premier number one you know queer um lgbtq a party that existed in that space right for a very short period of time the party that was made the party that i kind of i kind of found out about through like a daniel wang essay that he wrote on electronic beats back in the day right i remember printing it out and kind of reading that shit and thinking fuck i need to get to this club and then actually getting there going to cocktail de more and having my brain absolutely blown out from my head you know just having a great time so i just find it very difficult to believe and again even when i went to greece at that time the security guards were always a bit were always a bit angsty they, they were less kind of cordial than i would go to at other venues they maybe they the the, the the bouncers i remember at um or the security guards in general at Grease Miller back in the day used to be similar-ish to the security that you might see at like Sissy Foss or Caterblau, right? They were a little bit edgy, a little bit, you know what I mean? A little bit on the hard edge side. Okay, of course, you had to, you know, be polite and do the whole game, but it wasn't all fun, fun and games with them, which is fine. But again, you're allowed to have a bad experience with somebody. You're allowed to not get on with another adult. But to suggest that kind of represents, you know, latent racism and homophobia of that entire club was grossly unfair i thought really really unfair but again you know he needs to get his message across he needed to come with hell and fury in order to kind of get people to pay attention they did and in the end i guess it's for the better but i just thought that was gross that was like that was that was like come on really like i know you had a bad experience and it was obviously getting chucked out of a club you know half naked and shit not be able to get your coat you know being embarrassed you know having to have that you know it's just all awful i understand but you know come on accusing a club like that of racism is just like you know of homophobia again racism i can kind of get but homophobia oh ooh. and racism only because of the country not because of the club just for the country but again what i know continues with the help of diverse team of experts including music industry um daei trainer lindy D delight we completed a first training for our entire team on diversity awareness and conflict resolution the trainer team consisted of people color women and members of the lgbt community all of whom brought their specific perspectives on discrimination and harassment into the training with them we particularly looked at um at key problems such as unconscious bias structural discrimination white privilege microaggression and allyship it helped us get Gain a broad intersectional inter perspective to develop a higher awareness of racism, sexism, and homophobia. Yo, that's a lot, but again, they did it in it. They did it. I'll keep my thoughts to myself. Together as a team, we have been also discussed and defined who we want to be not to to no who we want to be as nightlife venue. 
So they want to be. Inclusive, safer space for everyone who loves electronic music is ready to fall in love with it. That is where we come from and what will never change. It pays for diversity in all areas, including promoters, event concepts, and various musical music genres that represents our scene. Interesting, that bit. A, a club with an atmosphere that is a tolerant, open-minded, fair, and respectful in order to ensure our venue and more equitable in the longer term. The reason why I say interesting, because from what I remember... The Grishmere programming has always been pretty varied. They never really had, I wouldn't say it was a techno club, especially in the mornings. Like people will be playing some mad shit. I remember going in there once and someone was playing Christina, Christina Aguilera, bruv, mad loud. Britney Spears, like Duran Duran. Like it's not the place that you would go and say it's a techno club. I mean, if anything, it's kind of similar to like, imagine if like, same, it's, it's like a version of Same Heads in terms of musical policy like they, they they try and go for like people off the beaten track a little bit you know the more weirder you are the better it is so interesting to see that they're trying to you know they're going to implement that i wonder what that means does that just mean the, the what the promoters look like the color of them i guess maybe that wise i don't know because it, because it'd be funny if they start doing flipping emma piano nights as a way to kind of address this like it's like oh yeah yeah <laughs> We are aware that it was, um, sorry, the last one is a couple of an atmosphere that is tolerant, open-minded, fair and respectful in order to ensure our venue is more equitable in the long term. Cool, good, good points. Um, we are aware that it's something that we must work to every single night. Um, when we open our door, the training is only the start. That is why RSO crew also agreed to structural changes that will help us to live up to and commit to our values and prevent uh uh, values and prevent and better handle any form of discrimination and exclusion diverse group of employees have taken responsibility of the community continue um to process we started this includes organizing further and ongoing training collecting feedback from guest staff and working together with other venues um another step has been setting up and training awareness the team has also acted as a point of contact for guests who have experienced any form of wrongdoing <laughs> you could fill out a form if someone called you a nigger on the dance floor <laughs> no I'm joking, I'm joking. but yeah but you know it's all good stuff it's all good stuff it's the idea of discrimination blah, blah, blah. we also fundamentally reorganized the security department smiley baldwin one of the most experienced bouncers in, in berlin has taken over the responsibility of the management who's smiley baldwin they're mentioning by name and even his surname but again they take security and bouncers and Night. oh yeah the guy from the berlin bouncer sick oh that's awesome man he was really she's a really charming guy in that documentary he comes across really well him and the other one this one the one who's bouncing at that club that is now defunct oh man that's fucking sick okay that's awesome all right big up smiley yeah he came across really really well man um in that documentary berlin bouncer which i recommend you check out i think i made a review of it already in my podcast but definitely definitely check it out amazing documentary it really kind of gives you an, if you're somebody that gets a little bit annoyed and angry and pissed off that these clubs have door pickers and you know you go to the burger and you got money to go in and they won't let you in you know or you it's like a lottery for you to get in if you don't understand that whole concept definitely check out berlin bouncer it'll give you an understanding again you might not you might still come away from it thinking this is gay why am i gonna queue up for a club that i have to be selected to go into i understand Understand. but if you want to gain an understanding of what that's about and where that idea comes from and why it's so important and the uh, necessary role that they actually have in, at the club in terms of you know um in in some parts you say oh yeah the club is only as good as its people but again these guys are very responsible for how those people who those people are in that space and they're very responsible again maybe for the success of the space they might be 20 percent responsible for it you know what I mean you have your DJs, you have the sound system, the space itself, but they play a really, really vital role. So the fact that they got this guy involved is fucking sick. So big up again, big again. You can't, you can't hate on these guys, man. Like they've done everything. They sat down with everybody. They've written a free. They've got a free step. You know, um, what's what's that word called? Um, outline of what they want to do and shit. Outlining what they want, who would who do want to be as line and if Harry Smiley Baldwin, amazing. Um, he is working with his team and replacing our staff. Oh wow, They're replacing the entire security staff. Oh, okay. Yes, wow and yes. Like I said, I think it was a over. I think it was an overreaction to an individual incident that someone had in the club, especially when you're arguing with another adult, especially going back and forth, male to male. It's always going to end in that kind of conflicting way, and ten, in a kind of very high tension way. So to brace a whole team, ouch. You know what I mean? They're all out of a job. I don't know how I feel about that. But again, good to see Smiley there. They continue here. He said, we'd, all, we'd also like to welcome Daniel Plash on the team who's joined the management and has taken over responsibilities regarding the club. Who's this? Isn't this somebody? Yeah, wasn't this guy someone? Why, why does this name sound familiar? Daniel Plash, why does this sound familiar? Why does this guy sound familiar? Berlin, okay, Berlin Cup Commission says here, okay. 
he's part of the Berlin Club Commission. But I think it was something else he's included in too. Maybe is it this? I don't know. Anyway, doesn't matter. Who's Daniel Plash? Anyway, it continues. Uh, he says here, Daniel has expect experience and he's well connected as a former operator of Stadbad in Wedding. Oh yeah, true. Okay, cool. Maybe that's where I've known him from. Maybe an interview that way. Among other things for his work at the Berlin Club Commission. So they've done a whole revamp top to bottom, bruv. At the end of the day, we're doing this all for our guests, our, ourselves and experience of River Sudus. We're committed to representing and reflecting what the music industry and the club culture in Berlin and around the world stands for. Peace, love and unity and respect. With all these changes in place and everything we've learned in the last Last month's end with a new interior. Whoa, I can't wait to see the new interior. We are going to reopen River Sodas in November 20th, 2020. Each one of us will work hard to live up to the values we share, find out what's changed, and give us a chance to make it better. Fucking amazing, man. I can't I can't wait. I can't wait. That's actually awesome, man. Big up them. And then the opening party is then obviously you've got it here. Um, they've got it's, it looks like a strong group of locals because so, the only people I, I, I recognize are some surgeon Tom Trago, Sonny Sharp, um, Jesse J, of course, DJ Sotafet, Dana Rush, or Dasha Rush, sorry, Atta, the flipping Robert Johnson, Don. So, everyone else I don't really rec recognize. So, I guess they must be local people that they're kind of promoting, which again is something that I've always given the Berlin guys credit for, man. All those clubs that I went to, like there, was, there wasn't really a lot of people that flew in from overseas. Most of it was all homegrown talent, which is always great to see because people on the, on the dance floor, too, most of them are their friends and family come out to support. So, that's always great to see. But again, big up River Sudus. I can't wait to go there. I think it's now called RSO Club. So, you'd have to pronounce the word that I'm obviously not pronouncing very well. I can't wait to see what it actually ends up looking like on the inside. I'm assuming it's going to be taped up phones and shit so you won't see what it looks like inside until you go there and see it with your own eyes with your own eyes but regardless great to see good to see they addressed all the issues they're doing it big doing it big style cannot wait to go back there very soon anyway that's the Jackson Zinger Show episode number 519 thanks so much for tuning in it's been a pleasure to have your company once again if it's your first time tuning into the show via the podcast app you know what to do leave me a review if you're watching via the YouTube like, share, subscribe, all that good shit. And I'll see you guys again very, very soon, innit? Take care, be safe. And I'm actually going to end this today with a tune, a song. We're going to do an outro. We're going to change the podcast thing. So if you listen to the podcast app, you're going to hear a tune to outro its way out. If you like that, please let me know in the, well, email me. You know, you know what? Instagram me. Go on Instagram. My, my, I'll put my Instagram in the description of the podcast. Instagram DM me and let me know if you liked the little outro tune or should I just allow it and just end it how i end it which is end because know most podcasts they have the intro music and then they have the uh, intro music again on the outro or some podcasts have outro music and then they have an outro piece of music so let me know what you want to do if, no let me know what you like if you like the outro music if it's good if it's not good let me know and i'll move it and i'll change it da, 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 da. greatly appreciate it see you guys again very soon take care be safe peace